And in Brazil, online room sharing service Airbnb is bringing relief to the hotel industry during the World Cup. Three and a half million tourists are expected to visit Brazil for the World Cup. And with infrastructure upgrades unfinished, Airbnb is picking up excess demand for a place to stay, often at a cheaper price than hotels. In the U.S., Airbnb has battled with authorities who say the company sidesteps hotel laws. But Brazilian regulators have greeted it with open arms. Airbnb estimates 50,000 people will book with its service during the tournament. And for more on the sharing economy, we are joined by Arun Sundarajan, a professor at the Stern School of Business at NYU here in New York. Arun, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, let's start with Airbnb because it may be a success right now in Brazil, but it is facing a lot of challenges in North America and in some cities in Europe as well. Uh, the main issue seems to be the fact that they don't collect hotel taxes. And here in New York, the Attorney General is even subpoenaing some of the hosts. Yes. Do you think Airbnb is going to be able to solve its problems in some of these cities? Um, I hope so because um, I, I'm looking to the examples of Paris and Amsterdam where Airbnb did face trouble a couple of years ago, but <clears throat> sort of through open dialogue with the regulators, with the city mayors, with the officials, they've come to sort of an understanding that this is in fact good for the city's economy. Right. And they've put together a new regulatory framework that is inclusive of Airbnb and sort of brings the hosts sort of under the sort of the legal umbrella. So do you think that the um, sharing economy, though, should be um, privy, have to come under the same restrictions as some of the competitors in the industry, like the hotels or, say, in the car service, like the taxi services? Or should they be given sort of different types of rules, given they're not as, as profitable, say, as, as some of the large hotels? Well, that's, that's, that's a great question. You know, I mean, what, what, what you're highlighting here is that we are blurring the lines between what used to be personal and what used to be professional. Um, we used to have very clear divisions between this and the past. You know, you occasionally lent your apartment to a friend, maybe you gave someone a ride, you had people over for dinner, but or you were a professional hotel, a professional taxi, a professional restauranter. Now the lines are being blurred, and so what I think we need is a new set of rules that encompasses both the full-time professionals and sort of this new army of part-time professionals. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that they should be held to completely different standards, but I think that you know, it's probably in society's best interest not to put someone who drives a taxi or drives a lift car for you know, three or four hours a week, mm -hmm. um, hold them to the same sort of licensing requirements as someone who does it for 60 hours a week. Okay, so what do you make of the protests in London that basically the cabbies are saying that you know, they're not having to comply with some of the licensing <clears throat> restrictions that we have, the cost that they have, the, the, the sense of training that they have to undergo to be a cab driver? Are these legitimate arguments? Well, I can, I'm sympathetic to the taxi drivers in New York, in London, in all of the cities that they're protesting, um, because their business is changing. I mean, there's a new product, um, there's a new platform, and it's actually better than the existing product. You can hail a taxi, sort of, you can hail a car on your phone. There's much greater variety, there's much sort of a greater range of pricing. And so from a taxi driver's point of view, they're sort of seeing their world change around them. And of course, to them, it's gonna seem unfair. <clears throat> what I'm hoping we can do in these cities is come up with a path so that the experts, the expert suppliers, the taxi drivers in London, it's one of the most complicated cities mm -hmm. to drive in, right? Um, that they can sort of be moved onto these platforms, which will dominate point-to-point -point transportation in a few years. Mm -hmm. That we need sort of, that we can come up with a good transition plan so that the experts, the expert suppliers, the mm -hmm. taxi drivers, bed and breakfast, can in fact get access to the rich demand. Okay. that is coming through platforms like Airbnb and Uber. Now, speaking of the demand, we see statistically <clears throat> that around the world, uh, people are receptive to the sharing economy, overwhelmingly receptive. Yes. Um, what do you think it is? Is this a youth movement? Why are people so comfortable with sharing their living spaces, their cars with strangers? Um, there are a number of different reasons. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that there's not enough human connection in the world that like, you know, as technology progresses, we get sort of more and more isolated from each other. And I think part of the reason why the sharing economy is appealing to a lot of people is that it brings back a little bit of human connection into sort of economic transactions that have become increasingly impersonal, isolated, solitary. And so that's, that's part of it. And I also just think that in a lot of cases, this isn't just the lower cost option. 
it's the better option. I mean, if you look at the variety of offerings available on Airbnb, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sort of way better right. than most hotels. Right. Yeah. Well, okay, lastly, really quickly, uh, how, how important is social media, though, in establishing this trust between renters and, 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 and people, maybe putting together two strangers? Um, I, think it's, I think it's critical, because what because platforms like Facebook do is that they bring online real world social relationships. And allow you to see if you actually have something yep. in common with the person and if you feel comfortable, yes. right? And okay. like, you know, sort of real world social relationships. And so, um, you know, I think part of the reason why the sharing economy has emerged now and not 10 years ago is because we were waiting for this trust for the technology. infrastructure. Yeah. Right. Okay, Arun, thank you so much for joining us. You've okay, thank you for having That's, me. Yeah. Uh, Arun Sundarajan, a professor at the Stern School of Business here at NYU in New York.